Welcome back to the channel. How are you doing, people? Today, we are talking about helium mining amplifiers, flam boosters. They look like these. Lots of people have been messaging me saying, Mikey, can you help me out, please, mate? Um, if I buy one of these flam boosters, will I get loads more rewards? Can I buy a Ferrari next month? No, you can't buy a Ferrari but it might help. We're gonna talk about that in a few moments. Now, also, we get lots of messages from beginners who've just got into helium mining saying, Mikey, is a flam booster the same as a band pass filter? No, completely different, but some of these boosters contain a band pass filter. Now, I know some of you are going, Mike, I don't even know what the flam booster is or a band pass filter. Don't worry, all right? We're gonna to get to that in a few moments. I'm gonna show you what they do, break it down nice and simple for an absolute beginner to understand. Now, if you go on eBay, AliExpress, uh, Amazon, you'll see loads of these little amplifiers flooding the market, all right? Low noise amplifiers, they look a bit like these. Okay, there's loads of them out there. I've bought tons of them to test. Now, lots of people have been messaging, can you use these for helium mining, right? They work on the same frequency as helium, they amplify the helium frequencies. Over here in the UK, we use 868 megahertz um, and a few channels either side of it to do our helium mining, okay? That's the frequency we use. And if you're across the pond in the uh, States, uh, I believe you use 915 megs over there, all right? So these do a very good job amplifying the signals, but can they be used for helium mining? Watch this space. We're going to get to it in a few moments. Uh, we're going to be testing out these amplifiers here, you may have seen these on eBay, Amazon, AliExpress. It's called an Air Buddy Helium Mining Amplifier, okay? It's got two SMA connectors, power, power supply input right there. It's got adjustable gain on the side. There's a little pop just there and a little heat sink on the back. We're going to test these out, see if they're any good. See if they uh, meet the specification that's advertised, all right? We're going to be testing these right here on this spectrum analyzer, this little bad boy here. Uh, and more importantly, what I'm really excited to test today are these, the Flam Boosters. Now, Aaron from HNT Pro sent me these. Uh, he's a very nice gentleman, Aaron, at HNT Pro. I highly recommend the guy. Um, Aaron sent me these amps. He said, Mike, can you test out my Flam Boosters, please? Um, now, obviously, Aaron's a, a seller. He doesn't have all the test equipment we've got, so he's kindly asked me to test them. And I said, Aaron, I test out these amps, I'm gonna give a good, honest review. So if it's a bad review, I'm still gonna put it out there. Do you still want me to do it? He said, yes, I'm that confident, fire away. So Aaron sent me this, a 10 dB amp. Um, he's also sent me a 17 dB amp. Now, I know lots of you are thinking, I don't know what that means, Mike. I'm still trying to take in the term flam booster. Now, we're gonna to get to that as well in a few moments. Decibel readings, what it means. Uh, Aaron also sent me this. This is another form of amplifier for helium mining. Um, this amplifier is not the same as this type of amplifier. It works in the same way, but this amplifier goes up with the antenna. So, if you're a serious helium miner and you've bought one of our HNT penetrator antennas, this will be up on your chimney stack or up on your house on a nice big pole. Now, this amp here connects directly below the antenna, just like that, okay? And you use a piece of equipment called a bias T, let me find one, which looks like this. Now you power the bias T on the USB. The bias T injects power onto your antenna cable, your coax cable, which would run up to the amplifier. So this injects the power up the coax cable to feed and power this amplifier. And then the RF signals travel back down the coax. So they share the same cable. So that's what a bias T is useful. Now I'm seeing lots of people put bias T's right next to these and then set it up in a box. You don't need to add it if there's a power supply input, but we get to that as well, right? We're gonna do a separate video on this amp because there's lots of tests to do, lots of different readings. Underneath this cover, you take this cover off, there are several dip switches. You can adjust the gain. You can adjust it for one decibel, two decibel, four, eight, and 16 decibels, amplifying your signal going out and coming in. Okay, so we're gonna test that out. Now, in every video, I'm gonna keep it super simple. So if you're brand new to this, stay watching. If you're a tech head, you already understand all the technical terms. Jog on, move forward in the video, get to the technical test where we'll be rigging up these amps to this spectrum analyzer. Right, you've just got back from the pub. Big Dave at the pub has convinced you to buy a helium mining hotspot. You know nothing about helium mining. You're not technical at all. You don't even know what radio frequencies are. But Big Dave has told you you're going to buy this hotspot. You're going to be frigging loaded. So you've gone out 
and you've bought one of these, okay? You've treated yourself to a sense cap hotspot. Now this could be any hotspot, by the way, any brand, Bobcat, so on, all right? But for the demonstration, we're gonna be using this. So you've bought your hotspot and you've set it up at home, okay? You've done the best setup you can. You've got your hotspot in your house. You've run a nice cable up to your roof. You've got a pole on the side of the house. You're running one of our penetrator antennas. If you want to check them out, www.hntpenetrator.com. All right, check them out. Now you've got this set up. Now helium mining works in a way, it provides a network and it tries to provide coverage, um, coverage for devices to communicate with one another. So you might put a tracker on your car, for example, and as you're driving around, the tracker will send signals to its nearby hotspots. So you're providing coverage for the helium network. Now you've got your antenna up. This is your antenna right here. And this antenna, this hotspot, is listening all the time for incoming radio signals, okay? Now, someone else sets up a hotspot. Let's pretend this walkie-talkie is another hotspot, another sense cap. Because somebody else in the area sets up their hotspot right here. Now, every now and again, this hotspot will send a beacon and it will transmit radio waves only for a split second around its antenna. And the plan is to try and get them to travel as far as possible to give good coverage on the network. So every now and again, this hotspot will say, hello, can you hear me? Can anyone hear me, all right? And it sends a beacon. So that's what a beacon is when people are talking about beacons. So this will send a signal from this antenna right here. Let's put that there so you can see it. A signal will come from this antenna, it will travel through the airwaves, and your hotspot at home will witness that beacon. So it will receive the radio waves from this hotspot, down this antenna, demodulate the signal, take some readings, and say, yes, I've witnessed this hotspot. Okay, now every now and again, now I think it happens once or twice a day, some people are reporting four days up to a week, your own hotspot will stop receiving for a split second. So it will stop listening and it will send its own beacon out. So this will now send a signal. It will say, hello, can anyone hear me? And it will send a signal out. And this hotspot who's nearby will receive the signal because this hotspot's also listening all the time. And that is called a beacon. When this receives the beacon, it will witness that beacon. So when you log into your Helium Explorer app, and you see witness beacon, that's what's happening. Now, when you look in the app, it has all sorts of readings in there, okay? As SNR, that stands for signal to noise ratio. And I have another reading in there, RSSI. I have a number and then DBM. Now, RSSI stands for received signal strength indicator. So every time you receive a signal on here, so when the beacon travels through the airwaves, hits this antenna, it will measure how strong that signal is. Now it takes this measurement in DBMs. This is decibel relative to milliwatts. So don't worry about all that. It's just what we use to measure how strong the signal is. Now, when it witnesses a signal from this hotspot, it takes a signal strength. If the signal strength is too strong, okay, let's say this hotspot was right here next to this one. Okay, they're under 300 meters apart. It will take a signal reading, a, a signal measurement, sorry, a signal strength measurement, an RSSI. If the signal strength is stronger than, I think it's around 82 dBm, negative 82 dBm, we will say, hey, the signal's too strong. You must be too close to me. Okay, and that's how it can calculate if hotspots are in the same location. And then it will say, sorry, it's going to invalidate the RSSI is too strong. We're not going to pay out a reward. So it's very important if you're going to amplify a signal using a flam booster, not to amplify it too much where all the signals around you are going to invalidate because you're actually going to run less. So it's very important to get the gain of the amplifier, how much it amplifies correct. Right, let me show you what we're talking about. Okay, we've opened up Helium Explorer. Now you may open this up in the app or in this case, we're using um, Internet Explorer and we're looking at it on a web browser, okay? So this is my own hotspot, Rough Arctic Cheetah. And we're gonna look at the activity of what my hotspot's been doing, okay? So looking down here on the list, you'll see under activity, witness the beacon, witness the beacon, broadcast a beacon, okay? That's what we were just talking about. So your hotspot here, so if this was Rough Arctic Cheetah that we're looking at on the screen, sends a beacon, 
Okay, these are the other hotspots around. This sends a beacon, travels through the airwaves, and these hotspots witness the beacon. So, where it says broadcast beacon here, that's us sending a beacon. So let's take a quick look at that. We'll click on broadcast beacon. Let's scroll down a bit. And it says here, 14 hotspots witnessed our beacon. Now, why is it only 14? Right, because when this signal goes out, there's hundreds of hotspots that witness your beacon, hundreds, okay? It's probably heard all over the place, but for some reason, it only says 14 here. Now, I'll tell you why. When these other hotspots witness your beacon, they put their hand up on the net where they go, hey, I can hear him, it's me, I can hear it. Okay, now the Helium Network randomly selects 14 of those people to uh, record right here in the app, okay? They only allow 14 people to witness your beacon at one time. So although there's hundreds of people witnessing it, they randomly choose 14 hotspots to witness your beacon, which we're gonna look at here. So right here, we've got 14 hotspots of seen our beacons. So let's have a look. Okay, so scrolling down, uh, right here, okay? Magic Lilac Kitten witnessed our beacon and it had an RSSI, RSSI, Received a Signal Strength Indicator, remember? And the Received Signal Strength here is negative 108 dBm. Okay, let's go a bit further down. Um, magnificent Fossilized Wasp, don't you love the names? Um, this hotspot witnessed our beacon from my hotspot. Uh, it had a Signal Strength, an RSSI of negative 127 dBm. Uh, going down a little further, there's another hotspot here. This witnessed our beacon has an RSSI signal strength of negative 92 dBm. Now, looking at that, you would think, okay, so the negative 127 would be the strongest signal. Wrong, okay? The, uh, the closer we get to zero, now it's a negative number, the closer we get to zero, the stronger the signal. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Now, if these walkie-talkies were right next to each other communicating, they would have a really strong received signal strength indicator, RSSI. And they might measure a dBm of, at a guess, 40 dBm, okay, right next to each other. As they move further apart, okay, you, you put more distance between the two radios, it becomes weaker, so 30 dBm, 20 dBm, 10 dBm, all right? Now you can go right down to zero dBm. Now zero dBm doesn't mean no signal, all right? It's a very powerful received signal strength indicator. It's a very powerful reading zero dBm, all right? Now it goes into negative figures. So you might, might have these apart and you might get negative 10 dBm, negative 20, negative 30, negative 40, and it keeps going, all right? Negative 100, negative 120, negative 125, negative 130, and so on. Now in helium, it's able to calculate the loss between the hotspots, all right? Because you assert your locations, it can do a calculation. It knows roughly how many decibels in free space air it should lose. So you don't need to worry about all that, but it takes it into the calculation, okay? And it also takes into the calculation your gain of your antenna, and it works out your RSSI. Now, in helium, if you have an RSSI that's too strong, all right, let's say negative, Negative 70, we're getting borderline there of it invalidating it, right? It'll say RSSI, too strong or too close. Okay, now this depends on some other factors, the distance between the hotspots and your noise floor as well, your signal to noise ratio, the SNR reading. Um, so it does a little calculation with all of that to work out if the hotspots are too close or not, all right? Now it's quite easy to understand DBM. On the screen here, all right, negative 70, is a very strong signal, all right? It's kicking ass. Now, it doesn't end there at negative 70. It goes right up to zero and into positive numbers. But just to give you an idea of RSSI and to break it down so it's nice and clear to understand, negative 70, kicking ass, all right? When we get down to the negative 85s, 90s, okay, it's an excellent signal. Negative 100 to negative 110s, it's a good signal. It's still a very good signal. We get down to 120s, 125s, negative 120, negative 125, it's a fair signal. We're starting to get a bit patchy, it's breaking up. You may see slower data rates and things like that. Um, negative 130, negative 135, we're getting into the noise floor now, all right? We're struggling to um, receive the signal over the noise. Um, and at about negative 145, maybe 150, we've lost the signal. It's, 
below the noise floor, we can't hear it, all right? So that's really simple to understand. Um, so negative 145 is a bad signal compared to negative 70. It's that simple. Right, let's park RSSI and move on to decibel readings, okay? So forget about the RSSIs for the minute. Let's move on, let's talk about decibels. Okay, now Aaron from HNT Pro sent me this flam booster, okay, which we showed you earlier. Where is it? There it is, okay. And this amp is capable of amplifying a signal by 10 decibels. So it's a 10 dB flam amplifier. He's also sent me another one, 17 dB. And like we showed you earlier, this one's capable of adjustable gain, one, two, four, eight, or 16 decibels. What does that mean, Mikey? What do we need, all right? So let's talk about that now. Now, let's take this walkie-talkie as a nice little example. Okay, when you talk on this walkie-talkie, you go, hello, Dave, can you hear me, mate, all right? You transmit a radio signal from this antenna. Now, this walkie-talkie is capable of transmitting 10 watts of RF power. So the signal strength is 10 watts of power. Okay, if we amplify this signal, we're gonna increase the RF power. And when you amplify a signal, uh, to measure how much you amplify the signal by, you use decibels, okay? So if you're listening to music on your hi-fi system and you double the volume of the music, you increase that by three decibels. So three decibels, as you can see here, is times two of the original power. So if you had a signal coming in and you multiply it by two, that is three decibels. Now I'll give you an example. We take the antenna off this radio, okay? And we screw in, bear with me, and we screw in an amplifier. Okay, so we connect an amplifier to this radio. Now you wouldn't use this type of amp on this radio, but we, for the demonstration, that's what we're using, okay? So you put an amp on, and this amp is capable of three decibels. Let's put our antenna on there. Okay, now three decibels is times two of your power. Okay, so the 10 watts coming out of this radio is amplified, three decibels times two, it now becomes 20 watts. So we have 20 watts of RF power radiating from this antenna because we have amplified the signal by three decibels times two, as you can see right here on the screen, all right? Now, if we increase the gain, and this amplifier is now capable of uh, amplifying by six decibels. That is multiplying your signal four times, okay? Now, how does six decibels here get to times four? You'd think that'd be times six, it's not, all right? So six decibels is times four. And how do we get to that? We amplified it by three decibels. So our 10 watts become 20 watts. Then we amplify that 20 watts again by a further three decibels times two again to 20 watts now becomes 40 watts of radiated power. So that's four times the original power. If we continue and we amplify by a further three decibels, so we go to nine decibels, that's eight times the power. So 10 watts coming out of this radio is now radiating 80 watts of RF power. I really hope that makes sense. And as you work your way up, 10 decibels is 10 times your power. So this amp from Aaron here will take a signal and it will amplify it 10 times. Okay, so if it was 10 watts, now becomes 20 watts, 20 watts becomes 40, okay? 40 watts becomes 80 and it carries on, it does that 10 times until we get to 10 decibels. Now you can keep going up, 20 decibels is 100 times your power. Now equally, this can work in a negative gain as well. So we take our 10 watts from this radio, all right, and we use one of these. You've probably seen these splitters. And you couldn't, again, you couldn't use this splitter on this radio, but for the video, we're gonna use it as a demonstration. Now the 10 watts of RF power coming out of this radio is now split to these two ports here. Okay, we haven't got 10 watts at each port because we've divided the power by two. So negative three dB is divided by two, as you can see up here, negative three dB divided by two. So our 10 watts coming out of this radio now becomes five watts at each of these ports. We've split the power. Okay, so negative three dB is divided by two, negative six dB divided by four, negative nine divided by eight, and so on and so on and so on without boring you, okay? Now, this is where an amplifier might come into play. So if you wanted 10 watts at each of these ports, 
you're going to need to amplify this signal coming out of this radio by three decibels okay let's put that in there for the demonstration so you've connected your amp up to your minor for example in this case the walkie-talkie now our 10 watts is coming out if this amplifier was a three decibel amplifier the 10 watts would become 20 watts all right we put our splitter on bear with me let's connect our splitter up so we now add our splitter to the output of the amp all right now because we've got 10 watts coming out the radio the amps a three decibel amp for example it's amplified the signal by two we now have 20 watts 20 watts is then split between these two ports we have 10 watts at each port so we're back to our original power so that's where an amplifier comes into play now receiving works exactly the same way we're just talking about transmitting here but receiving works in exactly the same way so if you had an incoming signal let's put that down you had an incoming signal coming into this hot spot in fact, where's a hot spot an incoming signal coming into this hot spot okay and if you had an amplifier in line if you had a three decibel amp it would double the signal coming in and so on 10 decibels times that signal by 10 you've got 10 times the signal coming in that is a simple way to break down decibel readings. I really hope that makes sense because it's really hard to understand until you break it up into three decibel increments. Right, moving forward, let's get to some exciting bits and do some tests because I know I'm boring you senseless now. Now, earlier when we went into the uh, Helium app and we looked at our RSSI signal strength um, and we looked at the hotspots we can witness and that we beacon to, there was another reading in there just to the left SNR. This stands for signal to noise ratio and this is often overlooked in helium mining. Okay, what does this mean? So let me give you an example. Forget helium mining and radio frequencies. You're stood in your kitchen at home, okay? Your refrigerator's making a buzzing noise. The washing machine's going, it's making a noise in the background as well, okay? So you've got quite a high noise floor in the kitchen. Now if you speak normally to your wife across the kitchen, she will probably moan at you and tell you what you're doing wrong, but you're talking to your wife across the kitchen and you can hear what she's saying over the noise floor. Now, if your wife started whispering to you and telling you naughty things because she wants some new shoes at the weekend, she starts whispering across the kitchen to you, you might struggle to understand what she's saying because you struggle to hear the whispering within the noise floor of the kitchen. Does that make sense? So the noise the washing machine's making, the noise the uh, tumble dryer's making, the fridge, you might struggle to hear somebody whispering at you across the kitchen. Now that is your noise floor. So the lower we can keep that noise floor, the better chance we have at witnessing a really weak beacon from miles and miles away because we can hear it. If we have a high noise floor, a load of interference, we might not hear that beacon. Now I'm going to give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. So. We've got this walkie-talkie radio right here, okay? We're going to use this as an FM radio. We're going to receive a local radio station called 1017 FM, okay? It transmits from about five miles away. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to play that now on a walkie-talkie, okay? So there it is, right? You're receiving that radio station. Let me turn it down a moment. You're receiving that radio station, and it's quite a nice signal. Now, if you had a high noise floor, let me introduce some noise into the background, all right? Can you hear the radio station disappearing in the noise floor? We're struggling to hear the signal. Now, that signal has not changed at all. They're still transmitting from the same location. They're transmitting the same amount of RF power across this walkie-talkie, and we've not moved position either, so there's no reason for that signal to disappear. The only thing wiping out this signal now is a higher noise floor within this room, and I'm generating the noise from this spectrum analyzer. So let's remove the noise. We've got the music back, okay? So that is a noise floor. Now, if I slowly increase the noise floor, you can hear the signal disappearing in the noise floor. So that is signal to noise ratio, and it's really important that we keep our noise floor as low as possible. Now, I've done lots of tests on these amps before the video, and I can confirm this amp from Aaron at HNT Pro has a low noise floor. It's quite good, actually. Now, talking of noise floor, lots of people go and buy these cheap power supplies, all right? These USB power supplies, you can get them for about 99 pence. 
They've got very poor filtering inside, very poor. These, um, these are switch mode power supplies. And they, what they do, they switch on and off a certain frequency to produce the voltage we want. And these operate around about 25, 26 kilohertz. And they generate a heck load of noise. Now, what happens? You take this, let's pretend you're running a BIOS T to power your amplifier. You take this, you feed the power into your BIOS T and you mix that power in with your RF signal, your radio signal up to your antenna. So the interference from this is gonna wipe out all of your weak signals. So it's really important that we use a nice, clean, non-noisy power supply. Now, in a few moments, we're gonna test out some power supplies on the oscilloscope because you can actually see the noise on the screen here. Okay, so we're gonna test out some. Now, I've tested again the power supply from HNT Pro. It's a nice, clean power supply. Okay, it's very minimal ripple on it, so it works very well. Uh, right, let's move on. Let's move on, let's move on and do something interesting. Right, let's get to the good bits. Let's connect up some helium mining amplifiers to the spectrum analyzer and take some measurements. Okay, see if the gain on the amp matches the specification advertised. Now we're gonna start with some of these little amps from eBay and AliExpress. These are low noise amplifiers like I showed you before. Okay, they look a bit like these. Here's one in particular we're testing. I've soldered two wires on and we've connected this up to our power supply right here. The power supply is kicking out 12 volts. Let's turn that on. Okay, and it's powering this amplifier. Now, can these be used for helium mining? We're gonna find out. Now, the spectrum analyzer, the spectrum analyzer receives RF signals on this port right here. Okay, it's listening all the time. A bit like your sense cap hotspot, it's listening for signals. And when it receives a signal, it calculates the signal strength of that signal, like your RSSI. And it gives you the decibel reading of that signal. Now, the second port on the analyzer is an RF output. This generates RF at a certain dBm level. Okay, we can control how powerful the RF is coming out of that port. So, for example, we take the RF from this port and we pipe it and feed it back into this port here and we can measure the gains and losses between each port, okay? It's as simple as that. I'm going to show you that right now. Right, now, on the analyzer, we have set it up to look at the frequency 868 megahertz and we're going to turn on the tracking generator which enables RF to come out of this port here down this cable and through this connector on the helium frequencies 868 and a whole load of other frequencies either side of it it generates a noise around this around the spectrum okay and it enables you to take measurements accurate measurements now the the level of RF coming out of this port here is negative 20 dBm. So if we connect the output to the input of the spectrum analyzer, we should see a received signal of negative 20 dBm because that's what we've got coming out of the port. So we pipe it around this cable, back in again, and we should see a received signal of negative 20 dBm signal strength. Now on the screen at the moment, it says negative 21.6. So why is it different? The reason it's different is because we've got a slight loss on this cable, okay? Now 20 dBm and we're measuring 21.6. That's a 1.6 decibel difference. Therefore, we've got a 1.6 dB loss on this cable. So if that was a negative gain on a, a coax cable or... Uh, some connectors in your setup. You can take them readings very accurately using this spectrum analyzer. Now what we want to do, to take the readings from our amps, we don't want to include the losses on these cables. We only want the gain or loss from the pieces of equipment that we put on these joiners here, in between these cables, sorry. Okay, so we need to know these cables on the spectrum analyzer. So we're going to do that right now, and then we can take some really accurate readings of the amps and so on. Right, okay, so we've normalized the cables, okay, so it's now ignoring the cables. There is a slight offset, a slight difference, but now we're kicking out negative 20 dBm and we're receiving negative 19.9, so there's 0.10 difference. Ignore that, all right, that's so, so, uh, so minuscule, it doesn't matter, all right? So we're pretty much reading now on the input what we're outputting on here 
excluding the loss on the cable. Now, if we put something in line, let me show you a bandpass filter, okay? So the bandpass filter will only allow frequencies through that we want to use on the helium mining network, all right? So that's 868 megahertz and a bandwidth for frequencies either side of it. So we're going to slip this in now in between these cables. So we've got every frequency coming out of this port now at negative 20 dBm. Now this should block any signals except the helium frequencies we want to use, all right? Let me just put a coupler on there. So let's pop that in line now. And as you can see, we no longer have a straight line. We now have the helium frequency shown on here because this filter, this bandpass filter is only allowing them frequencies through. Now we've got a loss now of negative 22.8. All right, we're putting out negative 20 on there and we've got negative 22.8 on the receiving side. So we've got a loss in this filter of 2.8 decibels. That's pretty damn good, all right, for a bandpass filter. So if you've seen these on eBay and AliExpress, they're not bad filters. And what I want you to look at as well, just briefly while we're on the subject of bandpass filters, the width of that signal there, okay? We want that as tight as possible because we're only using this amount. Now, up here, all right, you've got cell phones, um, all sorts of devices operating, GSM band, uh, down here you've got amateur radio, TV transmitters, DAB, television, all sorts of stuff, all right? So we are now filtering out all of these frequencies that could potentially cause us interference or overload our equipment from, sh from signals that are too strong. All right, so let's take this filter out now. I'm gonna show you a different filter, just briefly. You may have seen these on the market. This is a bandpass filter as well, okay? We're gonna put that in. Now you notice the bandwidth of the last filter. Let's pop this in. And look how wide that is. 868 is where our little number one is. All right, this is a much wider filter, so it's not as good as one of these. So if you're gonna choose between either of these bandpass filters, choose this one here all right now we will do a video on bandpass filters and the, the losses and what they do and we take a load of readings but for now stick with one of these ones over one of these all right now bandpass filters are built into the amps from Aaron at HNC Pro and not built into other amps and I'm going to get to that right now right let's connect up our first amplifier to the spectrum analyzer take some readings and see if it works our first bad boy up is one of these all right this is from AliExpress uh, or it might be an eBay actually, but it's a little low noise amplifier. They cost about three or four pounds. Um, it's got a wide frequency range uh, up to 2000 megs, okay, 2000 megahertz. And it claims a gain of 30 decibels. So we're going to rig that up and see if it works. Now, looking at the amp, the RF input is on this side. So we're going to take our RF generator, our RF output from our spectrum analyzer, and we're going to connect it to the input. And we're going to take the output of the amp and connect it to the input of the spectrum analyzer, which is going to record our signal strength from the amp. All right, now, coming out of our spectrum analyzer is negative 20 dBm power. All right, so if this amplifies it by 30 decibels, negative 20 dBm, negative 10, get to zero plus 10 all right we should be reading around about 10 decibels for a 30 decibel gain so let's turn the amp on see what happens there we go there's our signal strength there so it's 11.42 decibels so it's actually 31.4 decibels of gain at our helium frequencies of 868 megahertz all right so the amp is doing exactly what it says 30 decibels can we use that for helium mining as it is no now the reason being, this amp is amplifying everything within the radio spectrum up to 2000 megahertz, okay? <clears throat> so just above the helium frequencies, we have things like um, cell noise, okay? So when you're on your mobile phone, uh, 900 odd megs, lots of cell noise and GSM signals. Uh, just below we've got um, uh, business radios, okay? Uh, DAB radios, FM radios and stuff like this. So. If we have this amplifier running and we have something transmitting nearby, somebody on a radio or a DAB radio station, it's going to amplify that signal too and overload the input to our miner, all right? So what we need to do now is take out the input, 
and insert a thing called a band pass filter. All right. Now the band pass filter will block out all the frequencies except the ones you want to use for helium mining, which is 868 megahertz and some channels either side with a, you know, a little bit of bandwidth. Okay, so we'll put this in now. So we've got our RF coming out of this spectrum analyzer into our band pass filter. And this should block all frequencies except the ones we want to use. We'll then connect that into our amplifier. And as you can see on the screen now, it's overloaded at the moment, but it is allowing 868 through. It's also still amplifying some bits down below. And what we can do, let's turn that off again. We can insert an additional bandpass filter just after to clean it up a little bit. And hopefully we'll see some um, white noise and noise floor either side of the band. Let's turn this back on. There we go. Look at that. That's a nice signal now. So we're only amplifying the stuff we want at 868 megs. Now we've got a signal reading now, a uh, signal strength reading of 5.6 decibels. And remember, we're putting in negative 20. So now we've got a 25 decibel gain across this amplifier and the two filters. Now again, can we use that for helium mining? Okay, no, and I'm gonna explain why. This amplifier is amplifying signals that are coming out of this cable and traveling through the amp in that direction, okay? So if that was your antenna, and this was your miner, this side of it, all right? It would only allow signals to travel in one direction. Now, when you send the beacon, the RF needs to travel in the other direction. So let's turn the amp off, and let's turn the amp around, and see if we get any RF passing through it in the opposite direction, all right? Now, if RF passes through it, you could use this for helium mining, but does it work? Let's try it. So we've, we've turned the amplifier around. So we're now gonna take RF and inject it into the amp on the amplifier's output and see if it passes through and see if we can detect anything on the spectrum analyzer. Let's turn it on now. Absolutely nothing on the screen. So that's why a simple amp like this cannot be used for helium mining because it only allows RF to pass through it in one direction. Now, I see on uh, Facebook the other day, some people have rigged these up, all right? They've got this set up, and they've put some T-pieces in here, and a T-piece here, and they've put a patch cable between here and here. So, essentially, if this was a T-piece, essentially, it looks like that. And their idea was that when it beacons, it can pass through and travel down that cable and go the other way. You can't do that, guys. Don't do that, whatever you do, because what happens you'll get RF feedback, all right? A bit like a microphone feedback when you're at a karaoke and it starts screeching. As soon as the signal passes through the output, it'll go back round to the input, amplify it again, go back round again, amplify it again, and eventually this amplifier will blow up. And that's simple as that. So you can't use this type of amplifier for helium mining. Right, let's move on. Let's connect up an AirBuddy helium mining amplifier and see if that works, all right? These are bi-directional amps. One of these here. Let's try this out right now. Okay, so we've rigged up our Air Buddy helium mining amplifier. It's powered on now, it's connected to the analyzer. Now, it's a bit unclear in the instructions which way around you connect this amp. So we're gonna test it, all right? We've got RF coming in this side of the amp and it should leave and go this way. Now we're not getting any reading on the analyzer whatsoever. So this could be the minor side of the amp. Now, for a bi-directional amplifier to work, you know the amplifier we just showed you, all right? This one here, okay? This will only allow RF to travel in one direction. So you, you amplify your incoming signal coming down from your antenna. Now, when you want to send a beacon, you can't get through this amp, it blocks it. So what happens on these bi-directional amps, like the Air Buddy and the ones from Aaron at HNT Pro, okay, a set of little RF contact relays switch so it disconnects this amplifier either side it bypasses the amplifier goes around it and connects to your antenna so your beacon can come through bypass the amp and send out but it only switches when it detects a certain level of rf which is around zero dbm so if we now inject zero dbm into this air buddy it should switch on and bypass the amplifier, all right? So we're gonna turn up the output power going into it 
We're at negative 20 dBm at the minute. We're going to turn it up to zero dBm. So let's turn it up now. And as we get to zero, the light on the amplifier should turn blue to say that it's bypassed. So we're at negative three, negative two, negative one is flicking, zero dBm. There you go, the amp's turned on. However, looking at the reading on the analyzer, we're putting 20, negative 20 dBm in. We're only getting negative 13 back in the analyzer, so something's wrong. Now, this is a common problem on these and on the Jet Vision amps. The connectors are soldered direct to the circuit board and they go dry jointed. They're not very good connections. Now, if I pull that connector forward, see that on the screen? It's jumped up to six decibels now. So we've got six decibels of gain showing on the screen. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to quickly resolder this connector, run the test again and take some readings. The amp is now repaired, okay? We've resoldered the connector. If you're into soldering, that was the worst soldering I've ever done, all right? I didn't have my good soldering iron with me, so we had some shabby old soldering iron that we tried to make do with, and it's worked, all right? We've done the connector, we've repaired it. Now, if we turn on the amp now, okay, we trigger the amp. We're gonna make sure these switches open up so that a beacon can bypass the amp and go out on the airwaves. Now, this air by the amplifier claims a gain on the beacon um, between 5 and 11 decibels adjustable okay now it has this little prop here which allows you to adjust the gain all right so let's trigger the amplifier let's make a fake beacon okay so we're going to turn up our RF power leaving this um, spectrum analyzer to 0 dBm that should be the switching point for this amplifier to turn on to allow beacon to pass through it all right so we're going to do that now let's turn this on so we're at negative 15 negative 8 negative 4 negative 3 negative 2 negative 1 0 dbm right it has triggered the amp the light has turned blue <clears throat> let's take a reading now now 868 we've now got a gain of 8.64 decibels all right so we quite a good gain on the beacon all right however too powerful if you send the beacon out and you amplify it by 8.5 or 8.7 db db decibels all right it's going to be too powerful not only are you going to be breaking the law you're going to be breaking regulations and everyone witnessing you around you all right is probably going to invalidate because your signal is going to be too strong however the spec for this amp mentions adjustable gain using this pot so we're going to test this out now put our trimmer tool in the pot Right, the pot is uh, turned to its minimum now, all right? So we've got a gain of 8.5 right there on the analyzer. Let's turn the gain up and see if the pot works or makes any changes. So we're turning it up. Oh, look, we've got 9.7, 9.9, 10 decibel gain now. Okay, so it's turned it up to 10 decibels. So that's 10 times the power. Um, far too powerful, in my opinion, to send the beacon. Um, spec does say 5 to 11 decibels so no the amps not reaching 11 decibels it's only 10 maximum Let's turn it down to minimum the minimum on this particular amp is 8.5 decibels so you can't turn it down to 5 decibels like the spec says all right so there's the first um there's the first thumbs down from me on the air by the amp all right it's too powerful when you're beaconing now let's turn it around and see if it works with witnessing a beacon all right let's turn the power supply off and let's turn it around and try that out okay now we've connected up the amplifier the other way around all right so we're going to simulate witnessing somebody else's beacon now we're going to put some rf into the other end of the amp all right and we're going to try and amplify the incoming signal because we're witnessing someone's beacon we're going to try and amplify the signal and take a reading and see what we get, what decibels we get, what gain we get. Okay, so let's turn on the amplifier. Now we're putting into the amp negative 20 dBm, all right? We're coming out of the amplifier. We've got negative 8.32, 8.34, let's say 8.3 for argument's sake, all right? So that is a 
a stronger signal. Remember, the closer we get to zero BBM, the stronger it is. So the difference between a negative 20 decibels we're putting into the amp and a negative 8.3 coming out, there's a difference of 11.7 decibels. So this amplifier is working, okay? It's amplifying an incoming signal by nearly 12 decibels, 11.7. But can we use this for helium mining as it is? I would say no. Reason being, it's also amplifying every other frequency in the spectrum. So like we said earlier, if there was a cell site nearby or someone on their radio or a television transmission, it's gonna overload the amplifier and cause interference on your miner, possibly overload the input on your miner. So we need to put a bandpass filter on this amplifier. You can't run it as it is. You can. You might get some results, but it's going to be much better to run with a bandpass filter. Now, let's undo the input. And let's slip in a bandpass filter. So now the bandpass filter will block all the frequencies coming into the amplifier, except for the helium frequencies we want to use, all right? Certain bandwidth for helium frequencies. Let's connect that in now. now instead of a straight line appearing on the analyzer, Across there, we're now filtering out all of these frequencies. So there's white noise there. All right, we've got a gain now of negative 10 decibels. All right, so we've lost a little bit. All right, we're putting in negative 20, and now we've got negative 10.4. All right, so we've got a gain now of 10.6 decibels, which is still good. All right, we're aiming in helium now. I would say aim between sort of 10 and 12 decibels. Anything over that is too much. Anything below that. It's not really going to make much difference, to be honest, all right? So, we've got the bandpass filter in, and that seems to be working. Now, there's still a little bit of noise. You can clean that up again with an additional bandpass filter. Let me turn this off so we don't damage the amp. We can slip an additional bandpass filter in here. So turn it back on, take some readings. Okay, so we've got a nice, clean signal now, all right? Nice clean shape, nice clean pattern, loads of white noise either side the noise floor. So we're only allowing through the frequencies we want, we're only amplifying the frequencies we want when we're listening and we're witnessing other beacons. However, the gain now is negative 14.4, 14.5, let's say 14.5, all right? And we're putting in negative 20. So we're only getting a gain now of five and a half decibels thereabout, all right? So is it worth running? In my opinion, with the filters in, it's not bad. It's not bad, but I think you could do with a little bit more gain. Okay, we wanna, we wanna be aiming for around 10 decibels. So summing things up, the air by the amplifier does work. All right, it's too powerful when you beacon because it amplifies your beacon. All right, not only does that um, cause you to break regulations in the law, not that you probably care. All right, if you lived in the middle of nowhere and the be the, your other hotspots are miles away, you could boost your beacon, all right? I'm not telling you to do that, by the way, because that would be illegal. But you could boost your beacon and send the beacon a lot further. Um, however, if you're going to do that with the amount of gain this has got. You need a little bit more, a little bit more gain amplifying on the incoming signal. Now, with the bandpass filters in, we've only got five and a half dB. Plus, the problem with the connectors, where the connectors dry joint and they've, they've got only a tiny little bit of solder on them to uh, hold them on. So it's a big thumbs down from me on the air by the amplifier. Right, it's just more hassle than it's worth. All right, so let's move on. Let's test the amps from HNT Pro, okay? The Flam Boosters. Let's have a little look at them. I'm super excited to test these out. So Mr. Postman has dropped off your HNT Pro amp. It's arrived today in the post. This is what you receive, all right? Comes in some very fancy packaging, all right? Nice polystyrene uh, packaging around the amp and the power supply. It comes with a USB power supply. It looks just like this. All right, you can see it just there. Um, where's the spec on that? Let's pull that off. All right, an output of two amps. You've got a two amp USB power supply. All right, that comes with the amp. You've then got the amp itself. Let's get rid of that. All right, which looks like this. Comes with some very nice dust caps. Means nothing to us, but they look nice. And you have on the amp two SMA female connectors, all right? Now, take note, these connectors are screwed 
to the amp itself, the amp casing, all right? So they're not screwed directly to the PCB, the circuit board, like these are on the Air Buddy, all right? And, and the Jet Vision amps that are out there as well, they're, well, as much as they've got the nice metal case, their connectors aren't screwed into the case. They're not bolted onto the case. They're actually mounted directly onto the circuit board, you know, like, like one of these amps. It's soldered onto the circuit board and the case goes around it. Now, I've repaired about five Jet Vision amps in the last month with all broken connections, all right? I'll show you that now. I've got a, a photograph of one. All right, and you can see on this photo uh, where the brake is, all right? It's circled here. So this is a common problem on the Jet Vision amps and people are running these amps and only witnessing and beaconing locally. That's because the RF is jumping across that brake at a very weak signal, right? So people don't know if they're working or not. So the advantage of this amp here is it's screwed directly to the casing, all right? You can see it there. So it's a very strong connector with no strain on the circuit board whatsoever. So it's a thumbs up from me there. Uh, the only downfall I can see at the moment, if you're running a, a typical hotspot such as one of these, a sense cap, all right? If you look on the back of the sense cap, okay, let's focus that up. It's got a reverse polarity connector. So there's a pin, show, there's a pin sticking out inside there, okay? Now, if you take your antenna cable out of your hotspot, which looks like this, okay? This is a reverse polarity SMO plug. There's no pin in there. And you connect this into your amplifier, which appears to fit very nicely, just like that. There is actually no connection between there and the amp, right? Because there's no pin involved. So to connect to this amp, you do need to use a small adapter, all right? Which looks like this. Now take note, one end has got the same connector as the minor, all right? So they are the same connector with a small pin inside. So that will allow your incoming coax cable that you've already got to connect to that adapter. And the other end of the adapter is a male connector with a pin inside, which will allow it to fit into the amplifier, just like that, all right? So please be aware, aware that if you're gonna buy this amp and you take your cable out the back of your bobcat or your sense cap, as much as it appears to fit, there's no physical connection there, all right? So beware of that. Now, that's that, and equally, when you're connecting this up to your miner from the amps, so you've got your incoming cable, you've got the same problem, all right? You've got a male, a male connector there, and um, an, uh, sorry, a female connector there, and a reverse polarity female connector there. So you need to use a cable which looks like this, all right? Now, they look identical, don't they? But look in the ends. Okay, one end's got a pin, one end's got a hole, okay? So that end will go in the miner, and this end will fit into the amplifier, all right? So be wary of that, all right? Because a lot of people are connecting these things up, putting the plugs in, there's no connection. They think these amps are crap, they're not working. All right, and that's why they've got the wrong connection. Right, moving on, let's, let's test this amp out. Sorry, before we move on, I've just spotted one other slight issue, all right? Now I've got to find fault with these because I want to do an honest video. The power cable coming out, the USB lead. In fact, let's undo that first. Let's see how long that is. So we've got, I'd say it's just over a meter long. So you've got a nice length of cable on there to keep your power supply away from your mining equipment. I'll get to that in a minute, why you need to do that. Um, the only fault I can find here, where this cable exits the unit, there's no gland or glue or anything to hold it. If you look very carefully, all right, this may be where I've been moving it about, but you can see the cords from the cable and they could come loose from the circuit board. It's not really a problem, so I'm just trying to find fault with it. Um, but it does go in. Not really a problem because you're going to install this at your hotspot and you're never going to move it. Um, so it's not really an issue, but that's the tiniest little fault I can find with it. Um, I'd probably open it up myself, squirt a bit of glue gun glue in there just to support this wire because if you're not into soldering and this wire come off, it's going to be a big problem for you. Um, so that is the only fault I can find. Right, let's move on test it out and see if it amplifies and does the business. We're going to test it out, all right, let's go.
Looking inside the amplifier, this is what we have. A very nice looking purple circuit board. Very pretty, eh? Um, and to be fair, it looks all right. Okay, let me run over a few of the key components. So the power comes in here on the USB cable, five volts. That's your positive, that's your negative. Goes through this regulator. Now this drops the five volts down to, I believe, 3.3 volts. A regulated power supply then. And this powers the rest of the circuitry. Uh, this is the minor connector. So this connector go, runs off to your hotspot. This connector runs up to your antenna. Now, if you look at the incoming connector from the hotspot, it's got this component here, which connects up to this circuitry here. Now, this is an inductor. Now, an inductor, inductor allows DC voltage to pass through it, but it blocks out RF signals. Okay, so... This allows, looking at this, this means we could connect a bias T on our coax cable. A bias T goes down with a minor, okay, at the minor end, and you could run power up your coax cable if you wanted to put this amplifier up at your antenna. Okay, now the amp's not watertight, so if you are gonna do that, it needs to go in a nice little box or something like that. But that's what this component is here, all right? This allows voltage to run up the coax, to feed into this circuitry here and power the rest of the circuit board. Now, you know earlier when we spoke about the uh, beacon, okay, the beacon has to bypass the amplifier when it's sending a signal out from the antenna. So out from the minor up to the antenna and sending a beacon out. That can't be amplified. So looking at this circuitry here, okay, the minor end runs down this track here, up here, and through these little switches, these are RF relay switches, high speed switches. Okay, it goes through this switch, across here, through another switch, and down to the antenna connector, all right? So when it um, when it detects a signal from the miner, it turns on these two switches, and it connects this port via these switches to this port. So the RF travels down this track, up, along here, down and out, all right? Now, if you look very closely here, where it runs across here, there's another track side by side. Okay, this is a detection track, okay? Uh, sometimes referred to as an RF bridge. And it's so close to that track, although it's not connected, it can detect current flowing in one direction on that track, all right? And it partic in particular, detects RF. So when you send the beacon out, it detects the RF by the RF jumping across this track. Okay, it goes through this here. Now this here is a saw filter, a bandpass filter. Okay, it goes down to this here, which is a, an RF detector. Um, <clears throat> when it detects RF over a certain level, it converts it to voltage, turns on some circuitry here, which in turn turns on these relays, all right? So that's how it detects the RF. And it's, it's nice, it's got a bandpass filter there because that means other frequencies that have strong signals in your area won't be able to trigger this amp switching it on and off. Whereas the Air Buddy hasn't got that, all right? So it's prone to interference. This one isn't. It does have the bandpass filter right there. Now, when it doesn't detect an RF signal, okay, instead of it running up through this switch and across there, this switch now connects to here, all right? So RF comes up into this pin and it comes out of this pin normally and running through here when it detects a beacon. Instead, in its normal state, RF comes up Okay, and it runs down through this circuitry here. However, we're gonna be going in the other direction. So the incoming signals will be coming in here through these switches that are turned off. So it won't be going that way. It'll be going down here. It goes down through this component here, which is the amplifier. This does all the work, it amplifies. I believe that's some sort of attenuation circuit where we can restrict how much this amplifies by. The signal gets amplified, it runs across here. This little component here feeds power to this amplifier. All right, it goes through a decoupling capacitor to stop this voltage going this way. And it goes through another saw filter here, which then travels up through this RF switch and down to your minor. So these switches are reverse way round to each other, all right? So this, the inputs here and the inputs here on this side, the outputs of these switches are here and here. So in beacon state, when it detects RF, the RF's traveling through this unit. These switches connect this side to this track. It co connects through here, travels down and out there, sends your beacon out. When it doesn't detect a beacon, these switches are connected to these tracks here and here. All right, so the RF's coming in, 
you're receiving your beacons, you're witnessing beacons, is coming in through this switch, traveling down this ray, through the amplifier, through the band plus filter, up through this switch and back out down to the minor. And that's all there is to one of these amplifiers, not much to it. Now, take note of the casing around it, all right? Nice screened casing as well. It's a very nice looking amp. Um, I can't see what transistor it uses. I can't see anything, any markings on it. Uh, but from all the tests we've done, it looks okay. So let's fire it up now, connect it to the analyzer and see if it achieves the 10 decibel gain and the 17 decibel gain. Right, we're gonna go right in for the kill now. Test out the HNT Pro Amp, connect it up to the analyzer, take some readings, see if the gain matches the specification. Now, first up is a 10 decibel amp, this here, and we've got a 17 dB we're gonna test just after. Now, we're gonna set the analyzer up to look at 868 megahertz. Right, we're gonna turn on our tracking generator, and we're gonna normalize the cables. So it's only gonna look at gain across these cables. It's gonna ignore the cables, it's gonna null the cables, and only look at the gain applied to this port right here, all right? So if this, if this amp is 10 decibels again, it's gonna read 10 decibels on the screen. So I won't bore you with all the ins and outs. We've already done all that on the air, buddy. I'm just gonna go straight in for the kill, show you the readings, okay? Right, reading zero decibels again at the moment with the cables joined together. Let's take the cables apart. And first up is a 10 decibel flam booster. This is the uh, hotspot out. This is the output for the hotspot, all right? So we're gonna feed that into the analyzer. This is our fake received beacon, all right? We're feeding that into the antenna input of the analyzer. And straight away we've got 10.97 decibels of gain. Thumbs up for me, all right? So it's amplifying more than the specified 10 decibels, all right? We've got nearly 11 decibels of gain. It's a thumbs up for me, because normally when an amp specifies a gain, it never achieves it, all right? They, they over-specify it to try and sell it. But this is actually under spec, all right? So they advertise it as a 10. It's nearly 11 decibels of gain. So that's working great, all right? Now let's zoom into that signal. Sorry, let's zoom into that on the spectrum analyzer and we can test to see if it's got a bandpass filter. Now we can already see it's got a bandpass filter. It's only amplifying some bits in the middle of the screen here. So let's zoom in, take a look. All right, so what you can see there is a saw filter working, all right? So it's blocking out frequencies either side of 868 and it's only allowing for a certain bandwidth of uh, frequencies that we use in helium mining. So let's take a quick look and see what sort of bandwidth we've got on this amplifier. So before the gain starts dropping off, the usable gain, there you go, eight decibels. So we've got from about 863 megahertz at the bottom end. And at the top end, we've got about 879, 879 megahertz. Maybe a little bit higher. Uh, yeah, about 879. So we've got 863 to 879 megahertz. And that is our bandwidth, our usable bandwidth for this amp. It should block out frequencies either side of that. Well, it is blocking out frequencies either side of that. We can see that on the screen, all right? Right, let's, um, let's disconnect this now. And we're gonna test out the 17 decibels amp. Now I'm just gonna null the cables one more time just to check it hasn't drifted off. Okay, we're reading zero decibels with the cables connected together. Now we're gonna connect in the 17 decibel flam booster and see if we achieve 17 decibels again. Now, from the flam side, we're gonna feed that into the analyzer again. Feeding our fake signal. Straight away on the screen, we've got 17.13 decibels. So 17 decibels again. Great, it's working, all right? Thumbs up for me again. It is achieving the 17 decibels again as advertised, right? Again, let's test out the um, saw filter, see what sort of bandwidth we've got. I'm guessing they've used the same components, so it should be exactly the same, same bandwidth. Yeah, we've got from 863 megahertz. I'm moving a little marker up. 
about 878. So 863 to 878 megahertz of usable bandwidth, all right? Um, and yeah, as you can see, it's blocking out any signals either side. So it's a thumbs up for me, it's working. And the next test is to test the beacon. Uh, we're gonna pass a fake beacon through the unit at zero dBm and see if it switches on the circuitry that we explained about where the, um, so at the moment on the antenna side, it's receiving signals in this direction. They're being amplified and they come out of this port here into your hotspot. But when your hotspot sends a beacon, it needs to bypass that amplifier some little switches turn on, it goes around the amp, back down and out, and then we can send our beacon from our antenna. So we're gonna connect the amps up now the other way around and see if they switch on, allow the bypass to kick in and send the beacon. Let's try that now. Right, so we we'll start with the 10 decibel. So in the flam side of the booster, We're now piping in negative 20 dBm, all right? And we've got a gain of negative 35, so nothing's making it through this amplifier. Okay, we're gonna just take off the normalizer a minute. Right, now we're outputting negative 20 dBm, and we're not getting anything coming through through the amp, all right? There's a little bit of noise there. It's just because it's jumping across the circuitry. It's completely normal. Now we're gonna increase our output. So we're at negative 10 dBm now going in. Again, nothing switched on as yet. Because when it switches on, you'll see this fly up. Negative nine, negative eight, negative five, negative two. All right, we're at zero dBm and the amp hasn't fully switched on, it's oscillating on and off. Now that means we're not driving it with enough dBm's to make the switches turn on. Now that's not a problem with the amp, that's quite a good thing actually, because we need more power to turn it on. Um, the problem we've got, this analyzer, maximum output power is zero dBm. So what we're gonna need to do is connect a small amplifier on the output of the analyzer to boost our signal a little bit more to try and get this amp to turn on. So let's do that now. To amplify the signal coming out the analyzer, we're going to use one of these little tiny amps I showed you earlier. This was from AliExpress. It's a little 30 decibel amp, and it costs about three or four pounds. They're so cheap to buy, and they're great little amps. All right, so we're going to connect up this. Now, the problem with this, it's got 30 decibels again. Now, if we chuck in zero dBm out of this analyzer, we're going to get 30 dBm. That's way too much power to test these flam boosters with. So what we need to do, is reduce the output power of the spectrum analyzer. The lowest output power it will output is negative 20 dBm. So we amplified negative 20 dBm by 30 decibels with this amplifier. We're gonna end up with 10 dBm, all right? Negative 20, add on the 30, the 30 decibel amplification. We're gonna end up with 10 dBm. Again, that's way too powerful. So what we're gonna use is one of these here, one of these little bad boys. This is a 20 decibel attenuator. All right, and we're going to connect this directly on the output of this spectrum analyzer, all right? So we're going to connect that in there. So now we've got negative 20 decibels coming out of the analyzer. Let me put this lead back on quickly to show you the test. We've got negative 20 decibels coming out of the analyzer, all right? We're going through this attenuator, which is a further 20 decibels reduction, all right? So another negative 20. Okay, so we now should have negative 40 dBm, all right? So let's connect up a little coupler and take a reading on the analyzer and just check that we have got negative 40 dBm. All right, so we're negative 20 coming out, reducing by a further 20 decibels through this attenuator. Around this cable back in, we're reading negative 40, negative 41 dBm, we're close enough. Let's just say negative 40 dBm for the moment, all right? Now, if we take these cables apart, put that there, and we slip in between our 30 decibel amp, all right, we've got negative 40 dBm coming out, we're gonna amplify it by 30 decibels, we should now have negative 10 dBm or thereabouts, all right? So let's put this amp in line. 
turn the amp on. There we go, negative 9.2 dBm is close enough. So we're around about the negative 10 dBm mark. Now what we can do now, we can turn the output of our analyzer up slowly until we get to zero dBm. And because we've got this amp in line, it will allow us to go above zero dBm up into positive figures until our flam booster switches on, all right? So we can now amplify our signal coming out of the analyzer back in and we can go slightly higher than zero dBm. Does that make sense? Because before the maximum output power we had was zero dBm. So if I turn this up, the output by two dBm, for example, another two dBm. So we go negative 18 dBm. Okay, we've got negative seven dBm there. So if I keep going up, to around negative 10 dBm output. I hope this is making sense. There we go, we've got just above zero dBm. So if I wind this up by another dBm, there you go, we're reading 1.72 dBm. Now we wasn't able to achieve that earlier because we didn't have this amplifier in line. So let's turn that back down and we can now connect in our flam booster, slowly turn up the output power until we see it switch on. Then we can remove the flam booster take a reading from this amplifier and we know exactly what gain switches on the flam booster so let's do that now okay so we're going to take out this cable we're going to use we're going to use a 10 db first all right let's find the coupler we're going to go into the flam side because we remember we're sending a beacon all right well we're sending our ref through it in the same direction a beacon would travel and we want to read and see at what point this switch is on so that's the setup now, just to test our beacon. So this is the beacon coming from the miner, and if it switches on this amp, it should bypass the amp, travel through it and back out again, all right? So this is powered on now. Let's just zoom in slightly so we can see it a little better. Right, now we're gonna slowly increase the power until we see this fly up high, all right? When that flies up, that means the amp's switched into bypass mode. This is allowing the beacon to travel through, right? So we're gonna slowly turn it up now. And what you can see on the screen, before we do that, what you can see there, that's not switched on, all right? That's just RF jumping across the tracks inside the amp. That's completely normal. Right, we're gonna keep turning on now, uh, increasing the, the DBMs until we see, there we go. It's, turned on there but it's not fully switched on all right so we need to go a little bit further okay, another dbm i think we go one further right the i'd say that's the switching point there of the amp for the bandwidth we want all right so the amp has switched into bypass mode now it's allowing rf through yeah and we've got negative 1.58 dbm traveling through the amp Let's just take the amp out of line because of any losses, if any losses exist. Connect this in. We should get roughly the same reading. Yeah, 1.6. So I'll tell you what, let's just put the amp back in. Let's just reduce that power again, just so we can check we've done an accurate test. I'm just going to reduce the power slightly. Right, it's in bypass mode. It's half switched on there. We're in bypass mode there, but the marker there, number one, is 868, and we, we've not got much this side of it, so I wouldn't say it's fully switched on yet. There we go, so about there. Let's turn this amp off now. Let's take the flam booster out and measure the RF coming out of this amplifier. Right, so it's reading 0.2 dBm. So it is actually switching on just above zero dBm, but not quite a zero what we was outputting earlier. So it's a thumbs up from me. It is switching on slightly higher than zero dBm. Now, in my opinion, the higher the better, all right? Because it's less prone to interference of nearby stuff switching it on uh, into bypass mode. So that's great. So I'm gonna say about 
Point 0.5 dBm is the switching point to fully turn this amp into bypass mode to allow beacon to send. So thumbs up from me on that. Let's quickly do a test on the 17 decibel and just see if that switch is on as well. Right, we're going to turn the amp on. Yeah, it's switched on as well. Let's just turn our tracking generator down. Let's see if it's the same switching point. Yeah, exactly the same. Yeah, so about 0.5 dBm is a switching point for these Flam boosters, all right? So it's a thumbs up for me. They're working great. Now, I appreciate some of you are looking at this video thinking, Mikey, these are all perfect signals out of a spectrum analyzer. They're not real life signals. They're not traveling through the airwaves with all the noise and interference that signals are prone to, all right? So what we're gonna do now is the exciting part. I'm gonna take a drive to a nearby field, all right? I'm gonna plot this on the map as well, show the distance. And we're gonna set up this unit here, all right? This is an antenna analyzer, all right? You've seen this before in some of the videos. And this is used for testing antennas. However, this unit actually transmits a signal on whatever frequency you're testing on this screen. So we're gonna take this unit and we're gonna take this amplifier that we just used on the spectrum analyzer and we're gonna connect it to our antenna analyzer, all right? And that's gonna amplify the signal coming out of this analyzer by 30 decibels. Let's connect that up. All right, and then on top of that unit, we're gonna put a bandpass filter and the stock antenna from a helium miner, all right? We're gonna place this up on a tripod on a field and this is gonna transmit a signal around it and we're gonna drive back here to the workshop, use a radio receiver and try and receive the signal. Now before we go up there, I'm just gonna show you this unit on the analyzer so we know what kind of power it's outputting, all right? So we've got our unit here, we've got our 30 decibel amp and we're gonna use a bandpass filter on it as well so we don't wanna cause any interference around the area. So we're gonna filter the signal and we're gonna feed this into our analyzer right now and just take a power reading of what we're transmitting, all right? So let's turn our amp on. Right now, we've got zero reading, so something's wrong. Something's wrong, and that's because idiot here has connected the amp the wrong way around. So let's take this out again. Bear with me. The video was going so well up until then. Right, so we've got our amp in the correct way around now, right? RF's coming out of here through the amp, through the bandpost filter into this analyzer. Now we should be able to take a reading. We have got 5.96 dBm. So from our antenna, we're gonna be transmitting a signal level of six dBm. Now I think the average miner is around 16 dBm output, all right, when it's not restricted. So this is still quite a strong signal, all right, for us to test. So around six dBm of RF power is gonna be radiating from this makeshift hotspot beacon we're gonna put on a tripod in a field. Let's go. We've driven out to a nearby field. In the distance there in the background, we've got Harlow Town. And just over this way, is where our workshop is, okay? Um, I'm gonna plot on the map in a few moments how far it is. Now we've set up our tripod, and on the tripod, we've rigged up our antenna analyzer with the small 30 decibel amplifier, okay? Now this is radiating on 869.5 megahertz. All right, it's going through this amplifier just here. I've put a bandpass through it, or I don't want any interference in the local area. And it's radiating or transmitting a signal via this antenna and it should be covering all of this area. So we're gonna pop back to the workshop now, take a little look, see if we can receive the signal down at the workshop using our SDR receiver. We've just arrived back at the workshop. We've installed our Clark telescopic mast. And on the top of the mast, we're running a 3DBI HNT penetrator antenna. All right, so this is gonna receive the signals from the setup across in the field and we should be able to take signal strength measurements using this antenna. Now, if the signal's weak, we're gonna connect up the flam booster and see if that makes any improvement on the received signal. So let's try that out now. 
we're back inside the workshop okay we've ran the rf cable the coax cable from the mast in the garden that's running down through the window just up here and it's running down onto the bench right here all right we've used a small pig towel just to connect this up for flexibility all right because this big um s400 cable is not very good going around very tight bends all right so that's the reason for this pig towel and it's going to allow us to connect our amplifier onto this receiver when we test it in a few moments now we're connected up to a unit called an sdr play all right this version is the rsp dx they're about 150 pound they're great receivers all right now you can use these receivers to receive all sorts of things and listen to all sorts of things decode things track airplanes you can do what you want with them all right they're great pieces of kit today we're going to use it in its most basic form just to measure our incoming signal from the field nearby all right so on the screen I've taken off all the readings, all the technical readings, because I don't want to confuse you all, all right? It's, um, it's quite a lot to take in. So we're just going to use it in its most simple format, most simplest format, a visual format, all right? Now on the screen, in the center there is 869.5 megahertz. That's the frequency we're transmitting on from the field. Now if you look very careful, carefully at the screen, you can see a faint line down there, all right? This is a waterfall and it displays stuff it receives. Now ignore this over here, um, ignore this signal over here because this here is interference from the laptop, all right? It's, um, it's not a real signal. We're concentrating on this signal just here. There's a line appearing around here, all right? And that is our very faint signal we're receiving. So as much as we're sticking out a nice signal from the field, it's quite weak down here, all right? Now, if this was a real hot spot, a sense cap or a bobcat, it might not be able to receive this signal because if you look here this is a noise floor so this signal is lost within a noise floor and you wouldn't witness that beacon all right it'd be too weak okay so this is where an amplifier might come into play so what we're going to do okay looking at the noise before we, before we remove the antenna and connect the amp i'm just going to show you the noise floor all right now the dbm readings are up the side here all right now the noise floor is peaking around about it's peaking around about 130 dbm all right around there um so we're going to remove our antenna now okay remember we can barely see our signal coming from the field we can just make out a faint line there so let's remove the antenna all right we're going to connect the antenna to our we're going to use the 10 decibel flam booster first so we're connecting the antenna to the flam booster and we're going to connect the flam booster into the sdr receiver now look at the difference on the screen we can clearly see our signal now so that's amplifying the signal okay we was around negative 30 in the noise floor now let's go to the peak of that signal we're around negative 120 119 so it's amplifying the signal by 10 decibels it's working great all right this is a real signal coming in from a field nearby we could barely receive the signal a few moments ago now look at the signal now it's great all right we can we can clearly see the signal on the screen if this was a real hot spot now bang we've got a witness all right we've got a reward because we've witnessed that so that's where an amp would come into play now i'm going to take the 10 db out the 10 db flam booster out and we'll just quickly test the 17 dB, all right? So now we're putting in the 17 decibel. Look at that, much stronger signal, all right? So we was around about negative 130 in the noise floor originally with no amplifier. And we're around this fluctuate about negative 112 113 so again around around the 17 db um, amplification of the flam booster so again great stuff is working so you can clearly see the difference there all right that's working great now let's take the um, amp back out and we'll go back to just the antenna without the amplifier just so you can see it again So that is the antenna only connected, all right? I've not changed anything else, but remove the amplifier. 
you can just see it there mate you can just make it out there all right so the amps are working great now it could be a problem because that hotspot is quite far away all right it's very weak signal now a real hotspot would be a bit more powerful than this signal we're pumping out we're trying to keep things legal all right um, on the tests we're doing um, so what we're going to do, we're going to drive up to the field now, we're going to remove the, um, the tripod and the piece of equipment sending the signal, and we're going to bring it much closer to the workshop. There's another field nearby, a playing field, we're going to set it up there and simulate another hotspot nearby, alright, and try and amplify the signal then, and then we'll see what happens to that signal, and whether the 17 dB might be too strong, alright, let's try it out now. So we've set up the equipment, the equipment's right here behind me. It is transmitting a signal around this area behind me. We're in the estate behind me. We're gonna go back now, take some readings and see what it's saying, all right? It should be a lot stronger. So this is gonna simulate other hotspots in the vicinity around you. All right, we're gonna connect up the amp and see what happens now, okay? Let's go. All right, so we're looking at about 310 meters away all right so we're not far we're within limits of the helium network all right so that we're, you're allowed to be in the next hex 300 meters away it's going to be a strong signal so looking on here now all right we've got the antenna only going into our receiver into our SDR play all right and we've got a nice strong signal on the screen because we're right nearby and our signal is measuring approximately I would say negative 113, maybe negative 112, about negative 113, all right? So we're gonna connect up now our 10 decibel amplifier, all right? So we've got negative 113, all right? So that should amplify our signal by 10 decibels. Let's connect the amp in now. You can clearly see it on the screen how much stronger it is now already. Okay, so we've now got negative 103, all right? Or just, just maybe 102 there. So we've got our 10, 11 decibels of amplification. That's working great, all right? So we would still witness that and get a reward. That'd be fine, all right? It's not too strong, it's just right. And it also will amplify all the weak signals out and about as well, like the one we've just set up in the previous field that previously we couldn't witness without the amplifier. So. With this 10 decibel in, we've gained that as a witness, if you like, all right? So, it's working, all right? Let's take this out now and put the 17 decibel in and see what happens. Right, 17 decibel is connected up now, all right? You can see that there. Let's take a reading now. We're around about negative 95, negative 93-ish, 94, negative 95. All right, now it's a very strong signal. Now remember, I've removed all the signal to noise ratios because I don't want to confuse you, but that will have a very good signal to noise ratio as well, all right? And it's so strong now that this would most definitely invalidate. It would say RSI, RSSI too close, too high, hotspot too close all right and it would invalidate you wouldn't get a reward for this because you've connected this 17 decibel amp now you may pull in a few extras out in a distance but everyone around you for example on the the estate i'm on is going to invalidate because we're amplifying the signal too much now if you live out in the middle of nowhere all right you're out in the stick somewhere out in the fields and there's no immediate hotspots around you the 17 db will be great all right because you can amplify everyone out and about but if you're in um a town all right and you've got loads of hot spots around you you don't want to be going for the 17 decibel you're going to go for something lower the 10 or the 12 will probably work great you might find that people immediately um on your doorstep will invalidate but they're probably going to invalidate anyway if they're right next to you so yeah if you're in a town you've got hot spots around you 10 db or the 12 db maximum 
Um, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you could go for the 17 dB. All right, they're great amps, the Flying Boosters are from HNT Pro. Um, I'm quite impressed with them so far. Now we've got one more test to do, all right? Um, as the power supplies, because um, these contribute to the signal to noise, all right? They can generate a noise floor, like a lot of noise in the area, and they can interfere with your radio signals. So I'm gonna just quickly show you that, and then we're gonna wrap this video up and I'll leave you all in peace, all right? Right, we're going to take a quick look at power supplies and the potential problems they can cause to helium mining. Okay, now we're talking this type, so that's a genuine Apple power supply there. Now we've got one that looks very similar from eBay. This costs 99 pence, all right? Bargain, you say. It gives out a 5 volt, it charges your phone absolutely fine. Can we use it for helium mining? We're going to find out. We've got a genuine Samsung charger. And we've got the power supply from Aaron at HNT Pro. This was supplied with the Flam booster, all right? We've got this. So this is connected up at the moment. The voltage is coming out this cable. The other end of the cable is here. We've cut the cable and we've joined it onto the probes which connect to this oscilloscope. The oscilloscope is going to measure the noise on the power supply. Now, this isn't technically the correct way of doing it, but just for this video, it gives you a good little visual indication of some of the noise and what it does. Now, looking on the screen here, got a relatively flat line all right so that means it's less ripple it's quite a clean power supply if we unplug this and we connect into the Samsung all right look at the line now we've got lots of ripple and interference that's because it's a switch mode power supply so that is causing noise around this power supply on this cable now if you was running a bias T up to your amplifier okay and you connect this bias T into this power supply you're going to send that noise up this cable. It's going to mix in your radio signals and cause a heck load of interference. And equally, anything around this will suffer from interference from this power supply. Now let's jump down to the 99 pence eBay special, all right? We're going to plug into that now. Ripple on there as well, okay? So that the Samsung is designed to charge your phone, okay, but it's not a smooth power supply. It's not very clean nor is the 99 pence eBay special. Now, what do I mean by that, all right? I'm gonna show you a test, all right? This is Aaron's power supply. Let's unplug these two. All right, and let's put on an FM radio. Uh, has got married. Okay. I think, no, I think the entire so let's pretend it it official, so that signal you're hearing like is a beacon from another hotspot, all right? Aaron's power supply is plugged in, and, and we can receive that station ours. completely fine. Now let's connect up the cheap power supply. All right, and let's plug that in now and see what happens to the radio signal because of the noise level in the room. Straight away, it's interfered with the, with the radio station. We can still hear it. We've got a lot of background noise, all right? So if we were to try and witness that now, probably, uh, probably won't even be on your list in um, your Helium Explorer app. It won't work. So let's unplug that. Let's try the Samsung charger now, all right? Right, let's plug that in. Same thing, okay? It's interfering. Oh, let's unplug Aaron, sorry. Okay, so let's unplug that. Let's get rid of them. We'll plug the HNC Pro power supply back in. Let's move that there. No problems at all, right? It's not interfering. It's a decent power supply. It's working really well. Let's turn this music off. That's why it's important to use a clean power supply because it generates noise around the cable. Now, lots of equipment used for helium mining comes in metal boxes like this. That's for a reason. It screens and stops the interference coming in. Now, if you're running one of these splitters, for example, all right, these splitters work fine, but they don't have a case around them with screening, so they're quite prone to interference. If you was running this splitter and you had it all piled up behind your helium miner, whoa, and it was sat on top of this power supply, for example, you're not doing yourself any favors at all, okay? It's really bad. Now, I've seen lots of um, photos and stuff on eBay as well. Um, sorry, not eBay, on Facebook. Um, people are like um, setting up their miners in these nice cases. A guy put one up the other week. He had a nice case with a clear front, your temperature probes in there, fans running, switch mode power supplies, remote relays, um, and he had LED lighting running around the edge, all right? Now, all of those pieces of equipment, the switch mode power supplies, especially the LED lights, 
Okay, cool's noise. So he'd done a lovely box. It looked fantastic, but he'd done himself no favors. You want to move all this stuff as far away from the radio parts as possible. So your coax away from your power cables and so on. And that's all we're going to do. That's all we're going to talk about today on power supplies. We could go on and on forever, but it's boring. But I just want you to see, don't go and run a 99 pence power supply on your amplifier. It's going to do you no favors, all right? Now, I hope you enjoyed the video today. Come back. We're going to do the next video on antennas and how they work and how the radiation patterns work and all the interesting and boring bits related to antennas. I'll see you soon, guys. Thank you for watching.